It seems a very uh, um, select um, uh, group of guests here this afternoon, and I'd also like to mention that uh, uh, John Bingley is uh, with his companion are here this afternoon, and we hope to hear something from him um, after the break, uh, perhaps during question time. And um, I'd like to uh, um, uh, introduce um, Harry Beckow, who I believe you all know, and uh, who has, the most, has had the most remarkable career. And he's going to give us a, um, <coughs> a, a talk this afternoon and uh, um, perhaps some uh, new information, Harry, do you think? <laughs> but uh, either way, um, I, I know we're, we're all very keen to hear what Harry has to say, so there's no need for me to uh, add any more, I think. So uh, um, um, I'd like to introduce Harry Becker. Thank you. I'm not sure about new information because I come from an old school a long way back. And I'm going to begin by telling you something about my England as I first knew it. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Good. When I was born in Bristol at the beginning of 1914, there was no television, no electricity, no gas in our households. We used lamps and coal fires and you heated your bed with a stone bottle filled with hot water. Uh, there were no gay periods of dance in my day except that people had eventually their own dances which they performed and informed themselves. The most important thing for us in those days was uh, the Ten Commandments and that pretty well ruled our lives. Plus the fact that um, children had no expensive toys, there was nothing to do indoors, there was no television to watch, so they played outdoors. And there were scarcely ever any fat children to be seen, <laughs> but full of joy and athletics and beans as the British always were. As you know, we're always famed for love of adventure and adventure was in our souls from the time we were born because unlike the history books of today our history books told us all about the England into which we were born the England of the Anglo-Saxons <coughs> the England of King Alfred and forming his first so-called parliament about 871 and all the kings and queens which followed and helped to make England great. And the first period that I am interested in for you today is the first Elizabeth. Elizabeth I. The most wonderful queen this country has ever had. The country of whom the Spaniards, many times the size, were virtually afraid. The French ambassador said, if ever the Queen Elizabeth got angry, I would wish myself in Calcutta to be out of her rage. <coughs> and England was a happy country and an adventurous country. We sailed the world as we always have done. That is the secret of our great success sailing the world as a trading nation and eventually building the greatest navy. And our adventurers went as far as uh, part of Canada, even in those early days. They were also brave enough to take on enemies, no matter how big they were. And when the Spaniards threatened to send this magnificent great armada our answer was to go and have a look to see what it was all about and burn it down so the armada had to be put off for another couple of years and when eventually they came as you know they were defeated now my talk today is uh, without notes but i'm going to read you what i regard as one of the most famous speeches of all time and that was the speech of Elizabeth I which I think helps to sum her up. She says, my loving people, 
I have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to our multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live so to distrust my faithful and loving people. Remember those words, you will hear different later. I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguards under God in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I am come amongst you at this time, not for my recreation or sport, but being resolved in the midst of heat as the battle to live or die amongst you, to lay down for my God, for my kingdom, and for my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have but the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart of a king, and a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realms. That, I think, sums up the spirit of Elizabeth and her people who followed her faithfully. But unfortunately, it wasn't always so. However, out of this great Elizabeth I glorious reign, as it's called, developed something which is of great interest to me and also to you. To me, it's of interest because she built up the first great intelligence service. And as I became part of the intelligence service in the war, it intrigues me to know that her minister of state was one of the finest code breakers ever known. The reason I'm interested is because Elizabeth was able to learn the secrets of what the Spaniards were up to long before they ever set sail. So they knew what was coming. The other great thing is that the fact that our sailors were so dauntless helped to build what became the greatest navy in the world. And there's no two ways about it. The great British Empire, which grew from those days, depended largely on our navy, which was never beaten in battle, which commanded the seas of the world, and even more important, the sea gates. Do you know what the sea gates are? They are the gates which literally command the entrance to all the main ports of the world. From, say, Gibraltar to Panama, no ship could enter anywhere without the British Navy being aware of what they were up to. This leads to the First World War. And it was thanks to the great British Navy and its great strength that we were able to defeat the German built-up Great Navy and all its other opponents. This is something of great importance when you consider that we had against us some of the greatest powers in the world and we were always looked upon as a small island, which indeed we are not. However, with the help of the Navy and of course other services and indeed also our intelligence service at the time which broke the German codes and informed our uh, leaders exactly what the Germans had in mind, we managed to win the First World War. The First World War should never have been fought. It was an excuse for a war from an assassination of a local Austrian of no great value to anybody and certainly not to cause a war. But there were other enemies who intended that war to happen about which I shall talk later. It was the bloodiest war that had happened in this world so far. Millions and millions of young men were killed in the trenches for no valid reason. The result to us in Europe was not only the loss of our beloved people and the wounded, but also the fact that we were in danger of losing the strength 
of our empire. Remember, we had built this empire over 500 years. It didn't take that time to lose it. But it wasn't known what was going on at the time because there were undercurrents going on in the world of which we were not aware. And that will come on to later on. <coughs> Between World War I and World War II, there were only 20 years. And in that time, Britain had disarmed, thinking after the Treaty of Versailles that all was well. Germany was well and truly beaten. We had nothing more to worry about. So we <coughs> took our ease and got rid of some of our best armor and men and sailors and soldiers and airmen. Unfortunately for us, the Germans didn't think the same way. The war ended in 1918. Versailles Treaty was 1818-19. The Germans began rearming in the year after. In 1922, they struck a secret deal with the Russians at a place in Italy called Rapallo, whereby the Russians agreed to allow factories to manufacture arms, equipment of all kinds for the Russians in secret without the world knowing. In return for certain favors the Ru Germans gave the Russians, such as training their men. Only 20 years, but in that time, they had rebuilt their services so that when Hitler came to power, he found an armed service all ready for him under its original Prussian generals and general staff. What followed, as you know, was a bitter war where Churchill was beaten down by the appeasers of this country's government, Chamberlain and many others, who didn't want to go to war with Germany and were quite prepared to give all kinds of favors to Germany in order for there to be no war, which, as you also know, never works with appeasers. And fortunately, Churchill was eventually elected and we won a war for which we were not prepared. I remember students training with wooden rifles. I remember being sent to a place called Catterick to be trained as an artillery officer. And there was only one 25 pounder gun to train 125 new officers. The gun blew up in the breach in practice and so we were trained as theoretical gunners, officers who'd never fired a gun. But we still managed in the war. It's the indomitable spirit which somehow runs through our people. You can't see it now. You couldn't see it before the war because it didn't look as though we could ever fight a war. But when it came to enlisting and training, and fighting, there is no country in the world can beat the British, as we have proven. So there we were in 1945, quite happy. We'd had a wonderful growth of Queen Elizabeth I to be followed by almost a hundred years of Queen Victoria, where the British Empire occupied more than 11 million miles of the world, or almost half the world's gross surface. We had complete rule over 16 Commonwealth countries. Think of the expanse of this world, which was run by the British Empire. But without wars, there was peace all the time. And when eventually we had to leave, India, for instance, which was the crown of our empire, we had only about a thousand men 
controlling the whole of that subcontinent of India. And even today, we have the greatest friendship and respect on both sides. You couldn't wish for a happier time for relinquishing. But relinquish we had to, because those two wars took away the prosperity which we'd built up so well over the years and left us nearly bankrupt. We even had to pay for all those Lend-Lease ships which we got from America. We got some, nothing for nothing at all. We paid for everything. And into the bargain, after the war, we went back into Germany and helped Germany get on her feet again. The Americans also, with the Marshall Plan, helped Europe recover. But nobody helped Britain. We had to help ourselves. But there we were in 1945. Again, we'd won the war. We'd never been beaten. We had much to look forward to. There wasn't much money about. But fortunately, there was no inflation. Can you imagine a situation where year after year, your money remains the same value? No VAT. No unfair taxes. No taxes labeled, ladled on you for heaven knows what. You can scarcely buy a thing which hasn't got some kind of tax to it nowadays. I, I doubt very much whether they can find very much more or new to tax us on. All they're doing is adding on more taxes. What we didn't realize when we went out and fought that terrible war was that there were enemy operations going on around the world, under the surface, in secret, of which we knew nothing. They were not just jealous of what we built in the British Empire. They were also very interested in getting it done away with. Part of that came from our own English people who turned out to be, in a very small number, I'm glad to say, traitors to their own country. We have learned even fairly recently, which you can find out for yourself if you look up the uh, Wikipedia encyclopedia, do you know it, on your computers, and you just put the name Edward Heath <laughs> and search, and up comes the history of the man who was an agent for the Germans in the war. Not alone. Heath, but there were a small group of students at Oxford University Balliol College, of whom the master happened to be a friend of mine and came to visit me in Germany. And they were persuaded by German intelligence, secret intelligence, to act as agents. They included very well-known names, I won't go into them all now, but I think I would recommend that you turn up this Wikipedia and find out for yourselves who was there. For instance, one name familiar to you, I think, is Roy Jenkins. Roy Jenkins betrayed his country and finished up as Lord Jenkins and the head of Oxford University. Justice wasn't really done, was it? Nor was it done with Heath. Now, Heath not only betrayed his country, but he also betrayed his country even worse when it came to this new thing which was being set up in Europe called the European Union. Why people can be bought so easily is beyond my comprehension. People who've even, some of them, been in the services. They say money talks all languages. 
they are phrases like every man has his price. I'm afraid it's literally true to a great many. I ask you to consider, for instance, Macmillan decided that this country was economically unsound. He therefore decided he would apply for membership of what was called the common market. He sent his lackey, Mr. Heath, to put the proposition. General de Gaulle said, no, not right. You're not fit to join us, not because I have anything against you, but very wisely he said, you are a maritime nation and an insular nation. You do not belong in the body of Europe. That was sound advice if Heath had ever taken it, but he didn't. He was desiring to go, no matter what the price, into Europe. The reason was his price, what he was paid to betray his country, we haven't yet discovered. The fact that he was an agent was not discovered for 60 years, so well was it hidden. And it was on before his death that the information was given to him by both the German intelligence and the British intelligence, which gave him a heart attack, a collapse, and he died. <laughs> not too soon. <laughs> However, the astonishing thing is that not just Heath, but every leader succeeding him fell for the same situation, carried on the same treason to the country. <clears throat> now these are not just ordinary men and women. These are the people selected by us in elections Selected for what? To carry the loyalty of this country, to look after the people, to look after the sovereign, to keep our liberty and our sovereign rights. And they betrayed us. For what? For money. Now, I can't say to you for a fact that I know each one receives so much money, but ask yourself why? Why would they? give away this country for no positive reason. What good would it do them to give away the country? What good would it do us? We can only lose by it. As you find in your newspapers beginning to tell you, and the news is percolating through, exactly what we are now already losing from being members of the European Union. It is said that Hitler was financed by certain banks, international banks. One was called the Warburg Bank. Another was run by um, American German stock. Krupp's, the famous armaments firm also produced a lot of money to support him. And an American called Rockefeller, who owned one of the biggest banks in America, was a major supporter. Now they poured money into Hitler and they helped to train him to assume command of Germany. This was not done by accident. This man who had been in the uh, German army, I think he'd reached Lance Corporal or Corporal's state by accident. He was originally born in, in Austria, so they say. Managed to take over a whole country without training, without experience, with no record of service of his country at all. How can that happen? It can't just happen. He was actually put there. It was arranged for him. Just as I can tell you right now, every American president since Eisenhower, or even before, hasn't just got there by grace of God. He's been put there by the money people of America. And we'll come on to that soon. 
So what I have to tell you in the third part of my talk is something which is not very pleasant to hear. And when I tell you that the reason we're in this terrible state today is because of the people who've been traitors to their own country, I will read you a small piece from an ancient Greek called Cicero. And he says this, a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, but for he is known and he carries his business and his banners openly. That's the enemy openly at the gates. But the traitor moves among those within the gate freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears no traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a society. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. Those are the words of an ancient Greek. Still good today, are they not? But there was worse happening. I remember I mentioned to you some little time ago, money is the root of all evil, they say. Money rots the soul. Money buys people. The richest man in the world was called Rothschild. Now the Rothschilds grew to richness in the 16th and 17th century. About 1760, a certain man called Weisbach was a Jesuit professor of canon law, fell out with his movement and left them in disgust and decided to create his own movement. But this wasn't a movement in the same Christian faith. This was a movement without any faith a movement belonging to the devil. Do you know what they were called? Illuminati. The Immunati. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to hear that. What does that mean? It means it comes from the fact that the angel who was the angel of light fell from grace. And it means the people of light. And they set out, about 1760, to upset the whole world, turn it upside down, and create a new force for the devil. And they have been very successful, because they had, in the beginning, succeeded in getting certain um, upper Masonic Lodge members to join them, they raised 2,000 people within two years, mostly of the literati, intelligent people, educated people, people in higher levels of society. For some reason, they all joined in to worship the devil, to create evil in the world. It's difficult for you sitting here to imagine it, isn't it? It took a long time for me to really get to understand what it was about. However, this took place in Bavaria, and the king of Bavaria was advised by his counselors as to what was going on, and took immediate remedy and sacked them all. Out they went. Being penniless, Adam Weishaupt turned to Frankfurt, where he knew lived these wealthy Rothschilds. They took him in and took him over. And from then on, they ran the whole issue. 
What they intended to do was to reduce every country in the world by getting rid of its sovereign rights, its freedom, its laws, its property, everything that anybody could ever own, so they became almost poverty-stricken and necessary to listen and observe and serve whoever put the fear into them. Well, that's very easy to say, but it's not easy to do. So they set out long-term schemes. They knew it would take many, many years to accomplish. And what the Rothschilds did was to find elements whom they could test and try and discover to be loyal to them and to the precepts of this special serve. And it wasn't difficult to find. First of all, if you have all the money you need, it's easy to buy people. Even educated, even leaders, even people who run governments, even kings can also be bought. But to get control of a country is not that easy. So they set about, first of all, subverting the top people. Once they got them in a country, they could make sure that they would pass laws which would gradually deprive people of their property, of their rights, of their ability to move about freely, of their faith, of their religion, of whatever held dear to them. They even put children against parents. They even interfered with education in schools. And this went on all through the next two centuries. Long term, I told you, they estimated it would take them until the end of the 20th century to be able to reach the level they wanted. One of the most important countries for them was America. America had become the biggest and the richest country in the world. And they decided that the first thing would have to do would be get hold of the American money markets and reduce, therefore, the sovereign strength of the Americans. They would work on all the other issues at the same time. But that was the first thing. Have you heard of the Federal Reserve of America? Yes. Well, you would think that that was owned by the American government, wouldn't you? And it is not. It is privately owned. And what happened was that Rothschild sent his emissary, trusted loyal emissary called Jacob Schiff, to America to be introduced to uh, a bank called Kuhn and Loeb. And Jacob Schiff uh, immediately set out to marry the daughter of Kuhn, which he did. And then, with the money of Rothschild, took it over and moved the bank to New York. So there was Rothschilds set up in the bank in New York. They already practically owned the Bank of England, but now they wanted banks in America because banks have the power and the strength. So there was Mr. Schiff. And his first job was to get rid of the money of America. So he set to work to suborn people in leading positions in the government. It may sound crazy to you, but it can be done for money if you have it. He also took the leading banks and with Rothschild's money gave them all the extras they needed to expand and grow and grow and grow. <coughs> He suborned government people so that in the end, the, the Senate, the whole of the government set up, was practically run by Rothschild's people. Can you imagine that sort of situation? Gradually, the power of America, which started in a very good, healthy way, as did ours, 
was being seeped away and getting into the hands of people like these rulers who've been bought. And you can go through all the names, including Roosevelt and Hoover, all the names you know so well, they all belong to this CFFR, Council for Foreign Relations. And that's what they called themselves. So everybody who was in the CFR, you knew, was a traitor to his country. And what they arranged was that these banks would buy up all the money values going and arrange with the Senate that the next time a presidency came up, they would arrange who would take it. Sounds difficult, doesn't it? But for money, you can buy all the loyalty and the vote you need. They had to wait for a while, but they knew over the years they had to have patience until a gentleman called Woodrow Wilson was elected president. And immediately he was elected, one of the senators rushed a bill through both houses. And the bill was to set up this federal agency. And Wilson wasted no time and passed it on the 23rd of December when everybody else had gone home. And so America woke up to nothing new except there was a new Federal Reserve. And all they ever were instructed was that this belonged to the government. But it meant that the money of America was henceforth handled by foreign hands. Now, just as they've suborned everything in America and own practically everything, because they own the banks, they own the newspapers, they own the press, they own the media, they own Hollywood, they own the magazines, they own the journals. They own literally everything. So they run America. And they do the same thing over here. But this began with an organization in this country called the Fabians. Have you heard of the Fabians? There are leaflets over here about Fabianism if you don't know anything about them. Pardon? There are leaflets on here all about Fabianism if you don't know anything about Fabianism. Yes. I'm here. Good. I'm glad I didn't know that I didn't know this, but I'm very glad that there are leaflets you can read so you can check up on me. Um, the Fabians actually began uh, before 1900, and they were set up by quite astonishing people. You've heard of George Bernard Shaw? You've seen his plays, read his books. He was one of the people who set up the Fabian Society with the, the, the Webb family and Cohen and others, famous writers. Where, where they get the ideas from that this country cannot go on existing as it is, they said in 1900 about. Why not? Well, they think that it would be better if everybody was on the same level. They were left-wing socialists. And what they actually believed in was one world government. That the whole world should be under one government. And to get there, they use the Marxist principles. The Marxist principles tell you, you must get rid of property by making so many difficulties for property owners that they literally have to sell. Do you know that's happening in this country right now? Some of the most famous properties in this country, ancient properties in ancient families, are having to be sold. So it's working. It takes time, but it's working. They have to get rid of families. They put parents against children, children against parents. They have to get rid of all faiths and religions. They have to get rid of all feelings of sovereignty and freedom. And how do they do this? Well, one way they do it is by imposing fear, naked fear. Now, I don't know, I don't suppose anybody in this room 
uh, except me, remembers World War I. But you certainly remember World War II. And you remember the bombs crashing in on London and the fear of their lives of people. I know my family were in it. My family suffered from it too. We were all in it. And if you put fear into people's minds, they tend in the end to panic. Not that our people did in London and elsewhere, but fear was certainly there. And the demand for peace grows day by day, month by month, year by year. And if people are willing to settle for certain odd situations in order to have peace, then you can work the oracle and persuade them to do things you want them to do. And gradually you take their freedom away from them and their liberty and their sovereignty and they're left with what? A little peace? But we still don't know what still now is in store for us. We know that unfortunately our country has signed treaty after treaty which has been put forward by the European Union. I call it the GEU, the German European Union. You know why? After the Second World War and the third defeat of the Germans, somebody in Germany had the wisdom to say, it's no good going on fighting the British. We have to find other ways. Here we are sitting in disgrace. Nobody wants to talk to us. What are we going to do? So they sat down and worked out how to do it. And how to do it is done by spinning lies. And the Germans are very good at it. And where did they learn it from? First of all, from Lenin. Lenin ruled Russia on the basis of lies, lies and more lies. And he said, the more lies you tell people, the more they're going to believe it. And who followed him? A gentleman in Germany called Goebbels. You heard of Goebbels? He told lies like nobody else had ever heard. And the trouble is that in the West, that's Britain, America, in the West generally, people are far too trusting. They believe far too easily what is told especially by the good con men. I remember when Gorbachev came after Russia had collapsed on the Soviet Union and told us the story of how now this was a new Russia, a democratic Russia. All the old USSR was gone away and he told a very convincing story. And everybody believed him, including Margaret Thatcher, including the president of America, everywhere he went. He was one of the best liars in the world and he has since acknowledged that himself. Now, the Germans therefore practiced on that same basis and they wormed their way back into the good books, first of France. And gradually, they made their appearance before NATO and said, you are in trouble, you haven't enough military to cover all the problems of Europe. Now, we are not allowed to rearm, but we have men who are trained soldiers who will be prepared to act as peacemakers. And NATO fell for it. And as soon as they allowed these Germans to come in to help in, in their uniforms, Germany was already beginning to rearm in the usual fashion. And by telling these wonderful stories of continuous lies, they not only got back into good grace, but from 1955, remember the war was over in 1945, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt said the Germans must never be allowed to rearm, never be allowed to threaten the world again. 1955, the Americans agreed that the Germans should rearm. Only 10 years. And they did. 
And when they begin to rearm, they do it, and they do it very quickly. Before we could turn round, they had 100,000 men under arms, 150,000 men. Do you know what they have now? How? Somewhere around 400,000. Plus, the only country to keep conscripts. 1955, their Bundeswehr, as the German armed forces are called, was allowed to start. 1956, they began conscripts. So 50,000 new trainees a year. They get nine months training in a year, come on to the schedule. So it's not just 400,000, it's all these coming on behind. Why do they need them? They are now the commanders of Europe. It's acknowledged that all the leading posts in Europe are occupied by Germans. You can test it, you don't believe me. The result is that they not only command the whole of Europe, but they have the forces to take over if and when necessary. Where does that leave us? Well, the Germans don't feel very happy about the people who defeated them, neither the British nor the Americans. The Americans are long distance, British are close at hand. So what they're doing from the European Union is gradually whittling Europe, British people uh, of our England, especially England, down to a lower and smaller size. Have you seen the latest maps? Well, they're not late, they came out in 2006 on the restructuring of the British Isles. Well, it, they are available. You can look them up. The, the European Union will supply you with them quite freely. They show you the British Isles and the southern states are marked very clearly to be joined with the northern states of France. And the British Channel is now called the English Channel, the Manche, La Manche. The west of England, including Wales, now will go to Portugal and Spain. The east of England and the north of England will join up with Scandinavia and part of Germany. So in each case, we are losing part of our country. And the name England disappears entirely. They want rid of England. We're a menace. And according to these maps, that's what's going to happen. Because in 2009, the Treaty of Lisbon is supposed to come into effect willy-nilly. Somehow or other, they will either persuade the Irish to change their minds, just as happened with the French and the Dutch, that's not enough for them. You see, when you are living on a tissue of lies, the truth doesn't matter to you. The French and the Dutch said no in their referendum. That wasn't enough to stop them. So they produced this mangled f new form, which is the same constitution, but now called a treaty. And they expect everybody to sign it. And everybody does, except Ireland. Now why? Why? Out of 27 nations, why did 26 promptly give in and sign? Do you think they were all convinced that this was the right and proper thing to do? No. Somehow, they have all been bewitched. They've all been taken over. They've all been counseled, bought, persuaded. And I don't think they would do it for nothing. I am convinced, as I said before, that all our leaders from Edward Heath onward, have let us down, have betrayed us, and are guilty of treason. Even some of our members of parliament, our members of Fabian, 
And as such, they are pledged to get rid of our sovereignty. Some of them are, we even have privy councillors who are members. All of them betraying the oath each and every one has had to take. Loyal citizens of Britain, how do we manage to breed such people? How are they so easily persuaded? What is there to be offered them in this one world government? Can you see it being free to, and helpful to everybody? No, because these leaders already have it in mind to get rid of at least two and a half billion people who are no value. Some of them may exist in places like the Congo. They're no value to them anymore. They don't interfere in some of the battles which are going on where millions of people are being killed without interference. So they are ruthless. Those who give in and do as they're told will become willing slaves and they will be allowed a certain amount of privilege of life. But they will all be without freedom, without sovereignty, without the ability to make up their own minds and do as they will. They're the ones we have to fight against. Now, I write and I speak and I do my very best to persuade people that we do not have to sit down and suffer the indignities which they are imposing upon us. We have a duty as loyal citizens to rouse the people, to do our best, circulating whatever you can, whether it's leaflets which tell people the truth about the EU, or hold meetings or attend meetings, you've got somehow to rouse the people who have been made apathetic on purpose because A, they've kept the people in ignorance of what they've been doing. Much of what I've told you, you hadn't heard before, I'm sure, but it can be discovered because it's coming out nowadays. You can look it up in Wikipedia or Google. The information is there. They even, give you the information in Paris, if you go and fetch it, and in Brussels. But we have a duty, each one of us. And I will close by reading you one of my favorite Churchill sayings. And he said, nothing can save England if she will not save herself. If we lose faith in ourselves, in our capacity to guide and govern, if we lose our will to live, then indeed our story is told, and so is mine. Greatest book is called The German's Fourth Reich, and this will give you a lot of the information uh, I haven't given. No, there's, there's poor. Bill has been dying to ask a question. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. It was sorry. To, Bill. To, to, to Bill first then. Right. Uh, Harriet, um, I've always understood, um, if you were correct me, no doubt, that Edward Heath was led into being a traitor uh, because he was blackmailed through sexual indiscretion. <laughs> uh, although he was well rewarded by the Admiral. Uh, I wonder whether in fact blackmail might have played quite a big part Apart from financial bribery. Oh, yes. The question is whether Edward Heath. Anybody else guiding me? Edward Heath, it is questioned, was possibly blackmailed into becoming an agent. It's a very well known fact that one of the methods used in all this operation I've been telling you about with the Imulati and the other people is by getting them to reveal what they have done in the past as a crime or foolishness and using blackmail against them. That's going on in, if you talk to your people from Plymouth, they'll tell you the same thing is going on now. And I am sure that that happened because, um, you know, Heath was never married. Um, how he managed to uh, 
buy those two great beautiful yachts and the grand piano and the marvelous house in Salisbury is a bit of a mystery but I am prepared to accept that uh, the rumor that he was homosexual may well have been true uh, he did have an assumed girlfriend who was also a great musician if you remember that didn't get very far beyond the piano <laughs> Asking why it is that the Germans were able to rearm in secret and couldn't be discovered by our intelligence service at Bletchley Park. There was no intelligence service at Bletchley Park. Not until the Second World War. Bletchley Park was sought by intelligence people um, as a hidden place unlikely to be observed by anybody as abnormal and it's I think it started about 1938 so it wasn't there in the First World War however it is quite possible that our intelligence service had also been relieved of much of its talent for instance I mentioned to you that the high naval intelligence service in World War I in room 40 actually deciphered the top German codes without any machinery. They discovered the telegram which had been sent to Mexico to make war on America with Japan attacking at the same time and that was revealed to Wilson who had eventually to believe it and that's why America came into the war in 1917 but immediately after the war the whole thing was thrown out the intelligence service which had been so skillfully and well built up by a good quantity of people all kinds of people from it's an interesting story there were there were garment makers there was a priest there were all kinds of people brought in and and produced all this wonderful intelligence for the navy uh, under blinker hall his captain blinker hall and they were dissolved immediately after the war it's, it's, under, it's impossible to understand how we do it, but after every war, we disarm without hesitation. Most stupid thing possible. Okay, thank you. That's a question that, 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 in fact, there were intelligence operations going on, but in the police force and connected with. Um, what was then MI5 and MI6. Yeah. That's rather different from the code-breaking section. No, I realize, right. but what I meant to say is... The yes, code but I do agree, the police were pretty smart between the wars in tracking down... Uh, well, we to, well, result, some of you must remember the stories of the wonderful spying groups that were built up by the Russians. There were pictures of the spies who were opened shops in England and sent messages across to uh, Russia. None of you remember seeing those? No. Well, at home I have pictures. If you get in touch with me, I'll send you some pictures of these spies and the sort of things they used, like um, reducing a letter to a little blob of ink and sticking that under a stamp on an envelope. So when you receive the envelope, knowing what you're going to get, you carefully take the stamp off and get your machine to blow it up again and you've got the message. Completely secret. Um, Shall I teach you a few more tricks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the question is that um, apparently too much is made of Germany being responsible for... Um, the Second World War and what's gone on since in the way of betraying the whole of Europe. Well, my answer to that is these people are far more intelligent than to get themselves linked up only with Germany. Germany is another pawn in the game, but a very useful pawn because they are the most aggressive nation in Europe, the whole of Europe. If you remember, Churchill said, 
The Germans have been belligerent for 2,000 years and they never change. Now, the operation started with the Rothschilds, carried on by the Rother Rockerwells in, uh, in, in, in Rockefeller in America and by other people, used Germany as a pivot to conquer Europe. They want to get Europe down to the level of no unity, no sovereignty, no faith, no religion, no property, like all the rest. Well, if you've got one good pivot you can use, it's much easier for you. So, first of all, they financed Hitler. Not, not, just, not just Rothschild, Rockefeller. They financed the Soviet Union, Wall Street financed the Soviet Union in 1925. That's a different subject. If you want to open the debate, it'll take me half an hour. I can was built up there. The, the American organization set up by Rothschild in America also sent Lenin Trotsky to Russia with 300 trained hooligans in box cars and they saw them right through Europe and into Russia. And they started the revolution in Russia. So you see there is Russia, but others are being used. And Germany was the useful one in Europe proper. Because by arming Germany and training Hitler, and he had to be trained in all the things he was going to do, he had no training at all before he took office. How can a man without any training, whatever, no education, no facilities, no experience, suddenly take over the running of a whole country. Well, it just, it's not feasible. It took many years. Of course it takes years. They have the patience of the Chinese. They knew from 1760 that their plans of the Illuminati from the beginning weren't going to happen from breakfast to supper. They were going to take a long, long time. And they called them long-range plans. Yeah, so one of the long-range plans was to get Britain involved in the two world wars to knock out the British Empire. But it's the young children in the schools that need to be educated or told about something. Yeah. Because I go into school and I say, what's your name? I'm doing a register. And, um, I asked what the Christian name is, and the child would say, what's Christian? Yes. They don't know what that is. And yes. also there's the European flag in the schools and the classrooms. And um, it's just, I think a lot of teachers are very liberal and very left-wing. And if you don't get into the teachers' training colleges and into the schools, we're just whistling in the wind. We are. We are. Because the little ones just don't... Yeah. What you say is quite correct. Um, I told you all the headings of the Marxists and the Fabians. They're all in the same boat. They all have the same basis. They all want world government and they all know how to bring it about by trickery, by lies, by corruption, whatever. And I told you that they set the children against the parents and the parents against the children. This is just one of the facets. Now, when it comes to education, the past education in this country was second to none. I remember I went to a, a, an ordinary state school in my hometown of Bristol. I, I sat a scholarship um, in the town hall and I passed the scholarship and went to grammar school. This was how things were run, not only by the government and by the state, but by merchant ventures and councils of real standing and value don't exist anymore. Under this organization, which is worldwide, they are controlling education in the school. They are not teaching history before 1945. Think of that. All that I told you about the beginning of this wonderful history of this country built up over all those generations, not being taught. What, what's more, they're being allowed to argue in school. They're not allowed to be punished. They are being, they're, they're wandering in and out as they will. Um, no punishment's given. There is nothing in the way of proper exercise being 
uh, forced on them. Children more or less are allowed to run around as they will. And if you remember, when you went to school, you were immediately taught the three R's. That was the basis of understanding of education, wasn't it? That's what I began with. And as a result, I was educated. They're not being taught the three R's. They're not being taught how to hold a pen and write. I know. Well, my son and my daughter come home from school. Being taught. Yeah, just being taught that these people just are not. Yes. Well, this is what we're up against. What can you do? Nice. Um, oh, yeah, I'm just interested in what this lady is saying because what I was saying to you, yes. they're putting parents against children yes. and children against parents. This is being done on purpose. Yes. And they're also choosing, they're choosing left-wing teachers who go along with this and want to teach them this sort of early lessons on sexuality, on homosexuality. There was a story in the paper last week of a teacher who forced a boy to bend on his knees and pretend to worship Allah. And when he refused, threw him out of school. Fortunately, he was allowed back again. Don't you see, there are not all 100% good teachers. I wish there were. But we've got two questions coming. Not prosecute so many well-known Nazi leaders, apart from the ones in the middle of their trials, but we left a huge number in place and in power. Yes. And uh, we are some saying, surely we can do awards of that. Is well, you may be surprised to learn that there were a number of people in this country. May I go on? A number of people in this country and America who didn't want any harm done to the Germans after the war and wanted them back in power for their own nefarious reasons. For instance, the head of the American operation in the uh, occupied zones of Germany, you know, Germany was divided into four occupied zones after the war. The British held one, and I was there on the Rhine. The French held one, the Americans held one, and the Russians held Berlin and the East area. And this man, McCloy, not only let the Germans come back into power and help the factories start again, did everything he could because he had been so ordered from the organization in power, as I described, in America. So. There is no secret to the fact that the Germans brought, were brought rapidly back into good existence. It's, it's astonishing that the authorities who were in charge, including the British, and I can tell you a little story about that, um, were helping the Germans in many different ways, in ways they should not have been doing to get back to full strength. My. Uh, my wife was also working in Germany at the same time as me, and she was in charge of the visa department. No German could leave the zone without a visa. And also part-time working in IG Farben. Now IG Farben, as you know, was, had its headquarters outside Cologne. And they were instrumental in the war of supplying the poison gas and all the other diabolical instruments being used in the Holocaust to kill off the Jews and the gypsies and the deformed and the unwanted and the anti-Nazis, of course. That E.G. Farben company, very few people knew, had actually been started by the Rothschilds and belonged to them. It was a strange thing that they came back into operation so quickly after the war, when they were so guilty of the most terrible things of killing human people and helping the Nazis. They're back in power again, they're one of the strongest companies in the world, E.G. Farben. So you see, with malice aforethought, they knew what they were doing and they were helping them. About the Fingerprints being taken. Yes. The, the police are under instruction from the government 
acting from the European Union, all these orders, remember over 80% of the laws of this country now come direct from Brussels and just whistle their way through Parliament. So they're actually doing practically no work at all. Parliament has no value. Peter Lilly actually stood up in Parliament a couple of weeks ago in answer to members of Parliament who were asking for more money and bigger allowances and said, for the amount of work we do, don't you think 50% reduction might be better? He was howled down. Or is, uh, from what you say about children in hospitals and how they're being treated. But this is all part of the framework. Um, one of the ways in which they're trying to control us starts off with getting rid of the usual disciplines in the country, such as the councils and the boundaries of the different areas. What they're doing, first of all, is what's called regionalization. Regionalization divides all the countries, not just ours, but Europe generally, into blocks, smaller blocks, which are much easier to control. In our country, we've moved from regionalization to unitary style, which compresses it even more to allow control. Control direct from Brussels. These regions will have to report in future, not to the government, but direct to Brussels. This allows them to get more and more control. So you see, the value of parliament disappears. Government disappears. Government has no value any longer. They've already done away with the value of our sovereign because she has not, I don't know whether she signed the treaties herself, but her emissaries may, done, may have done. She's allowed all these treaties to go through, one after another, each one doing its share in dismembering our country. Now, the sovereign has the right, always, of yea or nay. The laws have to go through the sovereign. The sovereign can say yes or say no. But if the sovereign doesn't agree with the law, he or she is fully entitled to refuse, to send it back for reconsideration or what. That hasn't happened with any one of the treaties. And when questions have been put about it to the sovereign, the answer can, comes back to say, that's what the government has decided and that's it. Um, I don't know whether any particular questions on this particular topic. Uh so, I, I could chip in a little bit there, uh, quite simply. I mean, it, the answer is always given that the Queen accepts the advice of her ministers, which yes. is what Harry has uh, uh, absolutely said. Um, of course, I, those of you that might know my uh, affairs, I've been studying the, the English Constitution, and uh, it certainly seems to me, uh, and I would show you chapter and verse of it, um, but uh, it seems to me that there is a legal obligation on the Crown to refuse royal assent to the absolutely unconstitutional. Yes, yes. And it is perfectly plain from the oaths of office of our Privy councillors um, that they are not to pass any powers to foreign jurisdictions uh, or, or, and to maintain the preeminence of the Crown. Um, that I don't think that they have done. Uh, we all think that it's uh, absolutely failed. Um, I think that we need to start telling the Crown that we're aware that there is legal duty upon the Crown to refuse royal assent to the unconstitutional. Uh, and I would love to take such a case into court. Um, I believe that once you get back to the rack of first principles, as I like to describe it, there is no getting away from the fundamental logic of what our Constitution has intended, irrespective of what the judges and everyone else and the lawyers, are, and particularly the politicians, are saying. Um, but of course what's happened is the Crown has been isolated. Um, how much our Maj yes. Majesty is responsible for that, I don't know. But unfortunately, our means of connecting with the Constitution is through petitioning the Crown. 
and uh, it may be that, that that's a route that we need to go on a mass petition over uh, the right of refusal because at the moment they say there's no right of refusal Her Majesty must just accept uh, what is done by her ministers. Can you imagine Queen Elizabeth I Yes. Yeah. Accepting foreign princes or foreign ideas of interfering with her country. Why? I read out her statement for the Spanish Armada. That was the sort of queen she was. But that was Queen Elizabeth I. I think that uh, our learned friend here is absolutely right and questions should be asked. After all, the sovereign is there for the people. Yeah. for the people. The people have rights. Parliament is there because they are elected by the people to look after the interests of the people. The people are foremost. And nobody, queen, king or whatsoever, is above the law. And they must obey the law of this country, which is not now being done, as our learned friend told you. Um, on this subject, Harry, I wonder if I could bring in a, a chairman's question here. Um, we've seen that um, there was a, an individual, wealthy individual, who recently brought a, a high-profile case in the courts, which was thrown out. Anybody can help me with this? Stuart, Stuart, yeah, Stuart Wheeler. That that, that didn't uh, that, that was thrown out, wasn't it? Yes, so, yes, yes. They made an excuse. It was political. Yes, it makes one wonder whether if there were enough. Um, if there was enough wealth behind perhaps a number of cases all being brought simultaneously um, to perhaps bring a private prosecutions against our lords of misrule in various areas, seeking out where we could hurt them most, whether this, this could be um, rolled up to sufficient momentum to actually uh, have an influence. I don't know whether you have any comments on that. Well, I have one special comment, and that is, as I said earlier today, without money, it's hopeless. Money is needed to rouse the people, to be able to buy and set up newspapers. How do we get the lethargy out of the people and get them understanding what's really going on? What is done so far is to arouse interest in football yes. and other things <laughs> to almost to an exclusion of other interests on your television screens. Now, money has brought the world to the situation we're in now. From the richest people, the Rothschilds, that money has been used to suborn, upset, demean and reduce the whole of each country to the level they want in order to produce their one world government. How do you fight that? Can we find somebody as rich as the Rothschilds on our side? Brian Gerrish has no money and he has started the, the magnificent little newspaper which ordinary people like me, Marilyn, Alan, Mike are supporting. It's now nas it's gone nationwide, it now goes all over the world, it's read in Parliament, it's now read in the top uh, police station in London, we know that for a fact. Yes. And if Brian Gerrish can do it, and why, why don't everybody support him? If everybody here sent Brian £10 direct debit every month and they spread the news, we could have that a, a powerful force in this country. It, it really is already. But we need help. We all need help. We can't. I haven't got enough money. I give most of my money to Brian to, to, to keep it going. I sell his DVDs. I, I spread the word. You know, I'm only one person. We're only a few people. We need help to do it. He I must answer. United, yes. No, I must answer. I'm sorry. If a question is put, you can't add another question I must answer you're absolutely you're absolutely right he is one of the very few people in this country Brian Gerrish who is doing his best to offset and to counter some of the criminal things which are going on unfortunately he suffers from one severe illness do you know what that is it's lack of money now, whatever Margaret says is absolutely true, because as I sit here, I can assure you, I have helped him all possible. 
but I'm not of the size of the Rothschilds, nor is anybody here. We need Stuart Wheeler, they mentioned. Stuart Wheeler is a very wealthy millionaire. He runs a gambling business, and he decided to do something about it for the country. But even he can't raise enough money to keep paying for the ever higher legal costs. And every time you take a case to court, the costs mount up and up. And if you lose, and it's very likely with justice as it is at the moment in this country, you may well lose. You pay double costs of the whole thing. So that the German government like the British and other, all other European governments, all 27 belonging, have failed to tell the people what they're doing. They have kept the people in ignorance from the very start. That's part of the whole business. If you can keep the people in ignorance, you can slide things through. Yeah. As they did, remember, two days before Christmas in America, they put the Federal Reserve bill through, and it went through just like that. It'd be interesting to see how it pans out this. Each, each person in this country has a responsibility belonging to this country to do something to preserve it. Um. Oh. Yes, I'm aware of what he's aiming to do. He's doing a very good job. But it's, it's, it's really beyond the subject of this afternoon to go into the details. He's, uh, he's picked up in Plymouth on certain ill things going on in the area. He spread that out amongst the country. He's doing his level best to make the country understand some of the evils which I've been describing to you. <coughs> there are not many other people trying to do it. He's also producing a newspaper. Now, one of the ways of getting at the people is sending out real news in the newspapers. This organization under the CFR, the Illuminati originally, in America hold over all newspapers all television, all radio, all public communications, so that you cannot get proper information out to the public. Now, Brian Gerrish is trying to do it through his own newspaper. He's short of funds, and therefore his newspaper is late. I haven't received one for a couple of months. He needs help, but so do others need help. And wherever you can find anything worthwhile, do help them. Do your best, whether it's physically delivering leaflets for the CIB or whosoever, but whatever it is, to get us out of the EU is the first step and back on British soil. Did you have a, have a question you wanted to bring well, in? Well, it's more of a, a comment, really, so I... Do, do you will be interested, but I, I actually instigated Stuart Wheeler's challenge, uh, in, or initiated it, by writing to him um, because I wanted money uh, or to set up one of the, the things that I've envisaged is this whole problem of money and uh, it's always seemed to me that a uh, dream world it might be but uh, if you don't dream high you won't get there and I thought that if there was a hundred million pounds tucked into a fund uh, you would have you could set up a system whereby you had a pension fund in effect that didn't have to keep going cap in hand all the time back to uh, the people uh, for more money and that it, it would be big enough uh, in order that it could finance specific attacks on policies that were contrary to our constitution. Um, now, £100 million is an awful lot of money in private hands. It's not so much money in the corporate world. Um, and uh, I've always wondered whether it might be feasible somehow to accumulate an enormous fund that could then become self-financing. Uh, and I wrote partly with that in mind to uh, speak to Stuart Wheeler about uh, he having uh, been very successful in his business and also mentioned the fact that I and uh, John Greer, um, who I work closely with and Norris McWhirter, of course, in the past like, over the Nice Treaty uh, and the attacks in the court in the Nice Treaty uh, with Leo Lynn Price. Um, and I said that we were hoping to do something over the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, anyway, it, it transpired that we had some meetings, and we had meetings with Leo Lynn Price, uh, the QC, 
and uh, it was held that we would take forward an attack on the on the uh, Lisbon Treaty on the basis uh, of an, a challenge to the sovereignty of Parliament versus the rule of law, because that's the contest that we need to have. And um, anyway, it was agreed that we would do it, uh, and uh, money was forthcoming, uh, and so it was all going ahead. Uh, I attended a meeting uh, at which it was all duly organised, and that then solicitors would be employed to formally instruct uh, um, the, the, the QCs and so on. And at the following meeting, at which I wasn't attending, it happened overnight. We, we had a meeting on a Sunday, and uh, on the Monday there was a, was a new meeting at which I wasn't present. And uh, Leo Price had in fact been uh, removed from the proceedings. The court, the case had been changed from one of an attack on sovereignty to one an at uh, on uh, the basis of uh, not having a referendum. Uh, and uh, therefore it was about contract law rather than about constitutional law yes. as far as uh, we were concerned. I was bitterly disappointed that this had happened. Um, and uh, of course I, I, we weren't paying the piper, so um, he who pays a, pays, a, pays a piper plays a tune. And uh, somehow, and I don't know how, but somehow Stuart we had been talked in to changing his mind about what the court case should be. Um, but that aside, it went ahead with a different QC, a different, uh, whole different case. Um, it's very interesting, but it wasn't a case that I wanted to bring. Uh, and uh, certainly, as far as the initial idea uh, and the uh, challenge on the sovereignty of Parliament issue is concerned, uh, there was to be, uh, I think it would, would have been a very good case indeed. It would have been very, we were getting back to the first principles of governance. And it'd be very difficult to argue that there was a right within government to yep. give away powers to a foreign authority. Um, so that's what actually happened. Um, and uh, well, here we are, we've got to get, get the next one going. Um, just for what it's worth, um, in, the, in the first case of the Nice Treaty um, in 2003, I think it was, um, uh, Lord Justice Pill uh, uh, commented to Mr. Price, who was making the case for us, um, he said that, uh, um, oh, I hope you're not going to impugn the sovereignty of Parliament, Mr. Price, uh, leaning over the, the podium. And of course, uh, Leo backed off a little bit at that point um, uh, because he was trying not to get into too confrontational <laughs> yes. situation. Yes. And uh, in our subsequent meetings at the second time, um, I said to Leo, I said, well, you know, we really possibly lost a case then because would it not have been better if you'd actually jumped down Lord Justice Pill's throat at that point and said, actually, look, we have to have to get back and discuss the sovereignty of Parliament and the rule of law, because that's where this whole thing is going wrong. Um, and uh, Leo looked up and, and commented and said, Dicey's heresy. And uh, for those of you who don't know, but yes. Professor A.V. Dicey uh, wrote the, the, the phrase that said that Parliament can make or unmake any law. And uh, that has been taken to assume, to, to a level to assume that Parliament can do as it likes. That wasn't what Dyson no. meant. Um, and uh, it wasn't what it ought to be. Anyway, uh, Leo has, uh, owing to my uh, uh, bullets and so on, said that he's now reconstructed Dyson. Um, and so he believes that there has been uh, things. And if, if you. If you're interested in all this, the Countryside Alliance case in 2005 is very interesting because the judges say that, yes, they recognise that Parliament's sovereign, that's where we are today, but they also comment that it's judge-made law, it's only come out of the court cases, and that the thing is beginning to weaken, and it is beginning to change. And uh, it's quite obvious that if we have constitution and constitutional law, then that must limit and control the executive. And uh, I'll just leave you with one last thought. Um, Dicey actually wrote in his book um, on, the, on the constitutional law uh, an interesting statement. He said that the difference between the droit administratif, which is of course the uh, system on the continent, which is an administrative system and top um, and the rule of law is this, that under the droit administratif, uh, the judges uh, are only responsible to uh, the executive. But under the rule of law, the judges are responsible to the rule of law, and thus the yeah. executive is accountable through the judges and the law to the people, or through the people's court, should I say, to the people. And Dicey made that perfectly plain, and so he expected, at the end of the day, that the, the law should be obeyed. But isn't it um, so that, that was my ten pennyworth.
the matter of fact that if government makes a bad law, it can be repealed. Hence the uh, poll tax um, situation. There's a lot of legislation coming out of Parliament, which is actually a waste of time, and, and lots of people are sort of are fed up with some of the legislation that comes out of Parliament. But it can be repealed, and it can be changed. And as I use the example of the poll tax. Yeah, this, this whole business about whether Parliament can, can change laws or alter laws is, 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 is very important, but it's actually a little bit of a red herring because um, all of the laws that we need to support our Constitution are, um, are, are fundamental documents. There's our, our Declaration of Rights and our Bill of Rights. Um, and I think I've got a picture in here, certainly in my uh, presentation that I do on, on this. Um, all the law is current statute law. So whether it's irrepealable or, 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 or uh, uh, for all time to come, it doesn't actually matter. It's, it's actually currently in the statute book. And I believe that it goes far wider and has far greater bearing than the people at the moment have been able to, to, to bring to bear. And to this end, I always say to people that if you gave me five or ten million quid, uh, I believe that I could go a long way to solving the problem of the EU. And that may not be right, but I do believe that <laughs> what one would do is you could bring it up, you could address it in the courts on a consistent and uh, uh, continuous basis uh, with that money and bring some very interesting cases to light, which would at least raise the heat on the whole uh, question. But whether the justice or the judiciary are not going to whether it's all gone too far is, of course, a, a $60,000 question, isn't it? Absolutely. Now, if we're going to be fortunate enough in hearing our friend give a proper expose in the new year, so put put that down you in October. October, yeah. Oh, well, we'll yeah. There's a yeah. Okay. You've agreed to come in October. Well, uh, it, it was not not down to me. Between our common law which has just been discussed, and the European law. It's a very important thing because this country is famous throughout the world for our common law, whereby, simply put, a man is innocent until he's proven guilty. So you can't be arrested and thrown into prison for months on English law. But on European or Napoleonic law, you are guilty of any crime they want to put before you and they can put you in prison for as long as they need until you prove yourself innocent, which is rather different. That's a basic difference. But coming to the law itself, there is nothing better in this world than English law. Um, it's all about intent, of course. I mean, that's a, the whole yes. point. It's not about the letter of the law, the letter of the administrative issue it's about intent and that's a question of whether the people decide that the intent was there not on the state on the subject of the law i believe that uh, bill's got a question well, the question john who is the coronation oath actually uh, within this document uh, uh, her majesty's coronation oath uh, <laughs> i've got there there's a oh, but i've got um, there's a letter um, that i this is a very interesting letter here um, which again comes up in my um, presentation and uh, what it is is it was that my MP uh, back in 2000 was Howard Flight and uh, I wrote to Howard Flight and asked if he would ask a parliamentary question um, because I was probing this whole business as limitations of power. Was that why I was there? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, but uh, I think he fell out with Michael Howard on that one. Yes, um, yes. But uh, no, so uh, to probe the issues as, as to, up to power, and therefore I wanted to find out whether there were any actual limitations for the, to, to, to Parliament's power. So I thought, right, well, the very best thing to do is to ask the first primary question, is can they recommend a breach of the coronation oath? Because that seemed to me to be a terrific... Uh, starting point. So I got uh, Howard uh, Flight to write a question um, and, or to ask a question and it was a written question and he put it to uh, Downing Street um, and Downing Street found it difficult to answer. Uh, quite extraordinary. So Mr Blair had Jan Taylor. The Prime Minister has asked me to arrange for a Minister in the Home Office to reply to you direct. Well the Minister in the Home Office at that time was Jack Straw. And he did reply. 
Um, well, we got rather a good reply from him because, you see, we've pushed him back to the rack of first principles. Ex-communist. And, yeah. I can confirm that the coronation oath is a solemn undertaking by the sovereign and is regarded as binding throughout her reign. Her Majesty would not be advised to give her assent to a provision which contradicted that oath. That's not bad, is it? No. I thought, terrific. We've got the first limitation here. Here's something they can't do. Binding throughout her reign. That's and, very good. And so from that, I have worked up a whole case, in effect, which has never yet been heard. But there's some other very interesting things. Um, the, I'll read you just... Uh, if you look in uh, parliamentary practice, Sir Erskine May, this is a, a book, it's actually Parliament's very own handbook. And uh, I use it on the front of this little uh, document I've written up called Unlawful Governance. But uh, in Erskine May, um, he talks about limitations of power, and it says, The Act of Settlement affirms that the laws of England are the birthright of the people thereof. Right. And the kings and queens shall ascend the throne of this realm, ought to administer the government of the same according to the said laws, and all their officers and ministers ought to serve them respectively according to the same. The succession to the Crown Act, 1707, this is terribly interesting because, of course, this is at a time of Jacobite uh, rebellions and so on. And so it said, declared it high treason. High treason. It's a sort of nasty penalty for high treason. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, for anyone to maintain and affirm, to maintain and affirm by writing, printing, or preaching that the kings or queens of this realm, by and with the authority of Parliament, are not able to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity. Listen to that. Not able to make statutes of sufficient force and validity to limit and bind the crown. Terrific, that, isn't it? To limit and bind the crown and the dissent, limitation, inheritance, and government thereof. So if you wrote, print, or, sorry, wrote, print, uh, preached, or printed articles to, the, to say that that wasn't so, in the past it was high treason when it suited the government over the Jacobite affairs. Well, they only repealed that law in 1967, um, or that part of the law, and they repealed it with the, treason, uh, with the Criminal Justices Act against hanging. Um, so that was the only reason it, that that bit went down. But the principle is perfectly clear. The principle hasn't been changed, and the principle is the, the constitutional law plainly limits and binds the Crown and the government thereof. Therefore, I think we can rest assured that our Bill of Rights uh, and our Declaration of Rights and the Act of Settlement are acts aimed directly at controlling the use of prerogative power. Um, they have very great bearing on what the Crown ought to be able to do. Um, anyway, there you are. There it is. Well, we should, we should look forward to hearing yes. a clear statement on this. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. The name of Norris McWhorter came up. Mm -hmm. Norris McWhorter, a very fine man, uh, produced a newspaper called the Westminster Gazette, I think it was, um, which is one of the original newspapers which actually told the truth. There are not many newspapers which do because, as I told you, in America they're all under control. In this country, they are also pretty well under control. That's why you don't hear uh, the newspapers and the BBC talking about the European Union. But Norris McWhorter produced that paper with the aid of a young man called David Noakes. And in my book, which you're so kindly bought, there is a chapter on destruction of Britain's economy destruction of Britain's economy. That's one of the things they want, not only to get rid of the sovereignty, get rid of the uh, religions, they want to get rid of the economy and all the industry. Did you know, for instance, that Britain is lined up under EU to become a tourist state? And the farmers are going to give up their farms, look after the territory and uh, line it up to receive the tourists. They're not even supposed to be producing cattle any longer. Well, this destruction of Britain's economy tells you very clearly, very clearly, what the situation is in our economy, how much money is being spent, how much money is being wasted. Now, David Noakes began 
to my knowledge, to produce that same sort of outspoken newspaper in harmony with Brian Gerrish in Plymouth. And now he's disappeared. And that's a paper which I miss very much because he was able to, as a good journalist does, worm out the truth and print it quite clearly. And as a result, we learnt a lot of really what's going on in this country.